I'll talk a little bit about the structure of it. And then I'm going to read a few parts of it. One from the chapter three on conversion and counterconversion, a kind of general model. And then the epilogue has a little bit of autobiographical speculations. And then I want to return to um, to Paley Howolf's, you know, counterconversion from Christianity to polytheism and the whole idea around the whole idea of Oceania. So, um, and then we have the two um, wonderful respondents, and then um, Andy's idea was to bring this book into um, dialogue with local scholarship and issues in Taiwan, and if that happens, I would be really glad, you know, because whether, whether you're um, particularly interested in this book, but even if I could get you interested in these issues and topics, that would be I would be pleased with that, and so I'm grateful to have this chance to talk about it. Now, um, this book originally was titled Henry Torn from the Stomach, um, A Poetics of Conversion and Counterconversion Against the U.S. Empire. And then for all the reports for the longest time, it was, that was what the book was going to be. And then somehow the marketing people at Harvard University said, we don't like that topic. What does Henry Torn from the Stomach mean? <laughs> Nobody knows what that means. I said, I said, yes, when I do the Google search, it comes up with responses on ulcers, you know, like stomach ache, ulcers, so this is not good. But um, it actually was the l literal Hawaiian translation of opu kaha ia, torn from the stomach, and it was the mystery of what this first Hawaiian convert, um, you know, around 1810, uh, his name meant Henry Torn from the stomach, and they always, various scholars would interpret it as a kind of savagery towards the people when, you know, because his, his, um, he, his parents were killed by a rival faction in the Hawaiian political struggles, and then the man who killed his mother and father took him, adopted him, and so then he, was studying to be a priest. He was very learned. He was very good with language. And then, but when he had the opportunity, he jumped on the ship to go to Canton and Macau, and then to go to New Haven. And because he landed in New Haven, he kind of got adopted by the Dwight family. Edwin Dwight was a very distinguished. They had the uncle was the president of Yale University, Yale College, and so. He was soon um, became a very learned biblical scholar, and he and he had to manifest um, his religiosity through the born again experience. He kept searching for signs of being born again. So, and then he would anyway. Then he, he not only learned he went from Hawaiian to Pidgin English to you know he studied Hebrew and he studied um, Greek, and he was he was one of the key people to begin to Romanize Hawaiian. And so he wrote, he kept a journal, and then he, he died back in Connecticut. But anyway, he, his journals and writings are very interesting, and then it was turned into a memoir by the whites, etc. And so um, I, I, I take that accession into literacy and into writing as enabling him to have a kind of semiotic mutability and possibility of transformation, because even though he passed away in Connecticut, the Hawaiians became very literate people. They became, the literacy became a kind of empowering apparatus for preserving their own, you know, traditions in writing and then creating constitutional forms, uh, and flourishing of newspapers, etc. Now, the general idea that I was writing against was that Conversion is kind of the liquidation of subjectivity, the colonization of the native subject. And I was trying to show that um, within some context that might be true, but actually it can be an empowering semiotic of mutability and transformation. And, it, it, and to say that um, Henry was a colonized and uninteresting subject, Know, doesn't quite get at the because he, he, he 
kept his Hawaiian values. He, he never became an American. He, he was sort of an outer national subject, somewhere between Hawaii and New England, you know. So, um, but anyway, so they, they, Harvard University Press did not allow me to keep that title. So then I, I had to toss back five titles to my editor, Lindsay Waters. You know, one was Souls on the Road, on the road to be edited. Those were all Jack Kerouac titles. Because Jack Kerouac called the original one of the titles, he had a hundred titles for On the Road, one was Souls on the Road. And I, see, he was the Dharma bum mixing Catholicism and Buddhism, you know, so I, I could kind of work with that. But the Be Always Converting, Be Always Converted goes all the way back to 1640s. And it was um, Thomas Shepard, a Cambridge minister, and there's a kind of a paradox built into it. If you're converted past tense, it, it implies a sense of a fixed conversion. You're born again, you're saved, you're redeemed, you know, you, you've got it, you know, but if you're always in the process of converting, you're not quite there. And so you're, you, you, you're, you're searching through Buddhism, you're searching through transcendental meditation, yoga, tai chi, a very American, hunger for a kind of a religious experience that goes all the way back from back to this dynamic of the born again Puritan experience. So I was trying to take take or theorize the, the born again experience in a way that would um, make it capacious, mutable and and have a kind of semiotic potentiality that is not, you know, com the common way of looking at the conversion experience. So, uh, the part of the, the book I'm going to, um, to to read, you know, will kind of show that I was trying to pull conversion away from the Puritans towards Emerson and William James, and ultimately towards, you know, Jack Kerouac and a cast of thousands. But. Uh, yeah, now the other thing is, the subtitle, in American Poetics, but there's a kind of paradox in there in the sense that I have one Tongan writer at Paley Haofa that I consider absolutely crucial. So between the one Hawaiian writer that converts during the colonial era and then the Tongan writer who counter-converts during the post-colonial era, uh, those were the two, you know, kind of really crucial polarities. So, so I, I open with an introduction that kind of re-theorizes conversion, and then I have two.